Lucy. I, I've done triathlon for about three years, uh, ran for about ten. Um, so yeah, it's just really a Q and A session. Of how I've got kind of how I fit triathlon in with working full time um, and reach kind of the results that I do. So to give you a bit of background, um, I've got a, a marathon time of about two fifty three. Um, PB a few years ago, just as I start triathlon, did 2:55 this winter over in Dubai. Um, my half Ironman time is about 4:43. I've only done one Ironman so far. That was last year. Did Roth. Um, came 18th overall, fourth in age group. Had a lovely drugs yeah. test <laughs> from that. We had three hours in a drugs test in tent, which was exciting. Um, this year I, I'm going for Ironman Copenhagen in about seven weeks' time, trying to get a sub 10, hopefully a qualification, but we'll see. Um, so it's just really a session on what kind of training I do. Um, if you've got any kind of questions about what training you're doing, how you how, how it fit in the daily work, um, fitting in two sessions a day, often, um, resting, um, trying to get that balance. I'm lucky that my boyfriend also does triathlon, so our, bike, our house is just full of bikes and kit, <laughs> whereas some people might not like that. In our last place, we had a two bed flat where it wasn't really a spare room, it was a bike room. Um, now we've just got a one bed, so there's just kit everywhere. So, yeah, um, I know we've got some pretty good athletes in the room. I'm not sure what your kind no, of No, I'm not a good is. athlete. <laughs> I just, um, I, I run and I, I do sort of various, I just, I go to the gym and that sort of thing, but I'm more interested in sort of stepping up um, the running. My boyfriend's actually cycling in the Alps at the moment, so okay, he's part cool, of the Tour yeah. France. Oh, really, nice. So he's big on the cycling, I'm yeah. more big on the running, and um, just find it really interesting, as you said, fitting it in with work, doing the just doing training and how often when it comes to running and how you sort of yeah. build up your endurance for the um, for running for hours and hours and hours yeah. and that sort of thing in terms of also keeping yourself entertained. <laughs> I actually <laughs> use runner as a bit of a stress relief. Yeah. So I've always ran since in the school. You could do cross countries and stuff. I was never and I've got no hand eye coordination so and I was always too short for like games like netball just to hit me in the face. So I was like, right, I'll go and run. It's cool. Um so yeah and then I didn't really seriously get into running until I was about 24, I guess, and I moved to the Midlands from Newcastle, where I'm from, and I didn't know anyone, didn't know the area, so I just joined a running club, and you just see your times just drop, but just running with like-minded people, going to new routes, kind of find out a bit more about how much your body can actually do, and um, so I found running with a club really helpful, and at the time, I think I was running probably six times a week, um, you moved to triathlon, that's dropped maybe because I've got quite a strong running background, I would now only run two or three times a week because the other stuff kind of gets me that endurance base and um, I don't need to hammer it all the time on the run. I can get some endurance session on the bike without pounding the streets. So even if you're just training for a marathon, I would recommend some cross training in there because your body does take the battery. I find that now I have far less injuries doing triathlon than I did when I just used to solely run. I was, I was here more then than I am now. I mean, I come here now for my maintenance, probably once every few weeks, just to kind of get the legs a little flush out. But I, it's very rare now that I actually get an actual in injury that will stop me from training. Um, I think the more you do as well, the more you kind of learn about your body. So now I'll know what is just me being tired and what is me being continuously tired leading to some overtraining. So you've got to kind of recognize that and just take on that recovery. Um, and also niggles. When is it a niggle and when is it actually that isn't a niggle anymore, I'm just running through pain. If you start taking like, your and do every time you go out for a run or something, that, that's probably a good sign. So it's kind of getting to know your body and how it reacts to the training and what you're doing. Cause, um, kind of, I guess, normal season I'm doing 12, 13 hours a week of training. Peak at the moment I'm up to 15, 17 hours. Um, last week I was on a training camp, so that was much more kind of just day in, day out, intensive training. So now I've had a couple of days rest and kind of like, right, now I'll probably start to feel the benefits a bit more because we've come off the back end of one of those weeks and you're like, yeah, I'm tired. So it's, yeah, it's getting to know your body and how you can react to it. And also then, if you're working, I mean, I work nine till six every day. What do you do? I work, I, it's actually quite a pretty good job. I work as a um, logistics manager at Sport Pursuit. So I work in a sports kind of office. It's a startup, so. Do you know Brendan Yes, Brendan, oh, yeah. marketing manager. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, so we're a pretty small company, I know everyone there. There's, when I started a year and a half ago, there was like 15 of us, now 45. But everyone turns up, shorts and t-shirt every day. You can kind of get in on a Monday and just tell everyone about your weekend or what bike exercises do you do. There's people doing ultras. So you've got them kind of saying, you know, around about 75 miles at the weekend. And it makes me feel quite small. We did 10 hours of training this weekend. Yeah. <laughs> so you kind of got that around you, but I know most people don't have that. So you go into work and you can bore people for so long about telling them about, yeah, my heart rate got to this at the weekend. I did that many miles on the bike, but there's only so much you can kind of offload on that. So I'm, I'm pretty lucky in that I've got people that just listen all day. And, and then Chris, when I get home, will kind of, we'll share it a little bit and then it's right, what we have for dinner. Mm -hmm. then, then it's just chill. So you've got to have that kind of, be able to switch off a bit. I think when I did my first Ironman last year, I got a bit kind of, Ironman head on it, and it was like, right, it, everything was about the Ironman, so I think the month before was maybe a little bit really intense, but this year I'm a bit more chilled, I've got seven weeks to go, it's alright, I, I can cope, I know I'm not going to drown, I can get through 180k on the bike, and I know I can run a marathon, so it's ultimately it's just kind of like break it down, break it into chunks, manageable chunks, um, yeah, when I started triathlon I couldn't swim, I couldn't put my face in the water without choking, so it's kind of, right, I like a challenge, I can do this. So that was probably the October um, 2010, and then by the July 2011, I'd done a half Ironman. So it's just kind of then focusing on what you need to do, really. I've got some, mm -hmm. some group sessions, swimming, just really, really basics to start off on the right track. Because I had a go myself, Chris had a go at teaching me, and I was just like, this is impossible, I can't swim a length. And then once you get that stroke and you get the breathing pattern, you get a bit of technique, it's amazing how much you can kind of just take it slow, take it slow, then all of a sudden it's clicks and you can swim 1.9k with, without any real bother. So, Sorry, so is that the Ironman distance for swimming? No, that's half Ironman. That's oh, 3.8. 3.8 for Ironman. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so just building up to, to doing that distance. I don't think I ever really swim 4k straight in a, in a swim session. Mm -hmm. It's always blocks of... 200 to 400 as you get closer to the Ironman, maybe going up to like blocks of a kilometre at a time. But when, when do you structure your, your, your swim training for, Lucy? Because um, I, I find in the evenings, if I swim, I find I'm so wired, I can't go to sleep. Yeah, yeah, I, I struggle as well. And I swim quite late in the evenings. So I go to two squad sessions a week on a Monday and a Friday night, so it's rock and roll. <laughs> Friday night in the swimming pool, nice. it's like, you with like minded people, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So then you get home 10 o'clock and it's like, right. I can't sleep now. Then there's exactly the same running and cycling, I can sleep swimming, it kind of wakes you up. Yeah. So then the session I do on my own, I tend to do in the morning before work, and it actually sets me up for the day. So a typical week for me is probably, uh, I have six days of training, one day of rest per week, and on that rest day, I have a Spanish class, so then I can't go out and do anything else, so I make myself kind of go, right, today's my Spanish class. I'm gonna walk there, it's a 10 minute walk, like get the tube home, and that's it. I know that day is, is my rest day. Um, yeah, and then run days, I'm, like you were saying, I have to force myself to run slow. I'm used to running quickly, so my background is a runner, so I'm used to like going out, on a, even on, a, on an easy social run, we'll pick up the tempo doing six and a half minute miles of just kind of, yeah, but we're still chatting, it's fine! So, <laughs> but it's getting that point where you think, right, I'm going to have to go and train on myself today, because otherwise I'm going to go and try and catch the, catch the guys at the front of that group. Um, so it really is kind of knowing what you need to do for yourself. Um, other people might be going and training at 100 miles an hour. Doesn't mean you have to if it's not your goal. You just have to like know what it is the end goal for you is, and what you have to do to get there. Because I think mean, last year, the year, you know, the year before, I just basically ended everything on the calendar, thinking, oh, it'd be really, really good. It'd be awesome. It'd be awesome. I'll, I'll just win everything. And by the end of the season, you're like, I just want to go and sit in the corner and just sleep for about three months now. And so then this year, um, I've got a coach, a coach by Fiona Ford, who normally does this, this session, but she's away in the Alps at the moment having fun. Um, so I've got a coach, and it's really like just breaking it down and saying, right, what is it that you actually want to do? You can't do everything in one year. And so this year, it's my Ironman in August. That's my end goal. And I've only got, I've done two races so far this year. I've got another one in two weeks. And and then that's it, that's everything I've got planned. She's going to me, have you ended anything else? Are you sure you haven't anything else? I'm like, nope, ended nothing. So I'm feeling really good at the moment. I know what I'm, what I'm going to do. And I'm just kind of seeing all the results all my friends are doing. And I'm like, time, 
it's fine, mine will come, it's fine. And knowing that, feeling that confident in that I'm going to turn up on race day and be the best that I can be because I haven't been out just tapering, racing, recovering every single weekend, then I know I'm going to be fitter and kind of better for it. So how much do you spend time in the gym or doing, um, or how much time do you spend doing on your own body weight, press ups, sit ups, thirties, squats. I do two conditioning sessions a week. Conditioning. Plus, yeah, conditioning. Plus, I do a yoga session a week. Mm. So my conditioning sessions are um, often quite focused as well. So I'll have like a swim conditioning session where I work a lot more on the lats mm. and a lot more on kind of even just cable work, just getting that kind of the movement that you would get in the swimming pool mm. outside of the pool, just to kind of make sure everything's tuned up and kind of ready for when you do get in the pool, you feel a lot stronger. Um, running sessions, I mean, my legs are pretty used to running, so I've got pretty good balance and, and strength there. I can squat and lunge all day long and don't really feel it. Um, and then the cycling, I'm going for a flat course this year, which isn't really my strength. I mean, I've got quite similar legs, so I'm, I'm good on the climbs, I know that, but I'm like, right, I like a challenge. Go Copenhagen, that's pretty flat seeing the girls doing five hour bike splits at Copenhagen, like, right? <laughs> so this year has been trying to build up some strength in my legs. So everything is kind of got an end goal that I'm doing. And it's keeping that in mind when you're actually training, like what, why am I doing this? Why, why am I doing this particular session? So instead of just going through the motions, you're actually thinking about maybe the exercise you're doing and what, it, what it's going to do for your body. Um, Uh, I also spend a lot of time um, in the off season as well working on, on weaknesses. So as well as keeping that maintenance of your base kind of training and doing some maybe some sets that you wouldn't do within race season. So a lot of high high impact, high intensity stuff which you can't really do that close to a race. And as well as that, I worked over the winter a lot on my technique on the swim because I know for me that's mentally where I struggle. I'm probably far better at swimming than I think I am, but because I've not had that history of it, I always think, oh, they're better than me, they're better than me. So I've been trying to work smarter on the swim, because I know I'm never going to be first out of the water, but at least I can get out of the water and feel like, right, I'm ready for the next bit. So so I plan my week. I have training peaks as kind of my, um, my guide. So everything is on there for me. I know what I've got to do that week. And then so if I've got a double, double um, session day, then I know, right, I need this kit, I need that kit. What backpack am I taking? What snacks do I need at work so I don't just pick up the cake all day? You can work in a sports company, there is always Tran cake. Transition there. master, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's trying to get the smallest backpack possible without it bursting everywhere. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to know, so with all uh, all of the stuff that you do, with obviously with the planning and all the, um, all the, um, the conditioning and exercising you do, do you, do you have any like cheat meals or do you have anything like that? Like, do you, you is it just healthy like throughout the whole? I'm I'm trying to be eighty percent healthy. Obviously, Chris don't even bring. Yeah, <laughs> it's trying. Well, when you're tired, I think it's the worst thing. It's when you grab for the high sugar stuff to kind of give you a pick me up. So I tend to have like some nuts on my desk and so like I'm hungry. I'll go and have a glass of water or a glass of squash first just to see if that's it. But I mean, I eat probably six times a day, so yeah. I don't have huge meals, but I'll just kind of, I'll have three breakfasts. So it'd be one small breakfast before training, one when I get to work, and then one about 11 o'clock. And then I'll have my lunch at about one. And what, what about dinner? Do you have... Dinner, I have quite a late dinner, so it's not very big, because generally it's when we get home after training. So, so it's kind of smallish dinner. Yeah. yeah. I'm the same. Uh, do you, do you, what's, what time do you usually... Probably eat? after nine, most Oh, really? So, so yeah. small one. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So not huge, but it tends to be kind of a bit of protein, a bit of carbs, a bit of, yeah, just something so then you can actually go to sleep. So I have, yeah, I tend to eat more during the day than I do in the evening, just to fuel that training that's coming. I don't have, I don't get to train at lunchtime, but you don't have facilities at work for me to actually get showered and stuff, so it's either before or after work is, is how I train. What, what tends to be your recovery during so after you burn loads of calories, yeah. what do you first take into If I'm at home, then I can make a smoothie, because I just shove everything in a blender. Um, if I'm on the run, I will get like a recovery shake or a banana. Um, yeah, I've also just recently started drinking like the cherry juice oh. as well for a bit of, sure enough, yeah, to see if that has an impact. Um, my coach is actually on a paleo diet, so 
I was in the Alps last week with her, and so it's kind of like there was. It isn't that difficult actually to switch to that when you're in control of, of what food is around you and you've kind of got prepared for it. But yeah, I do sometimes slip and it'll be oh, grab a flapjack or something, which isn't the best, but it's just to get you through. Yeah, and then at home we eat quite a lot of like sweet, sweet potatoes, potatoes, a bit of pasta, a lot of rice actually. Um, trying to take a healthier option all the time, but enough so that you're not depriving your body of what it needs. And sometimes it is just a bottle of chocolate, I think, in the evening. I will just, I will just have that, otherwise, yeah, life would be pretty dull. Um, yeah, what else? Uh, I think a lot of it as well, if you're, if you're racing and it's, that's kind of new to you, I found I like a checklist. I have checklists for everything. So I have my kind of standard, this is what I need to take to a race checklist, and I have like a clear plastic box which you can take into transition. And I know that everything is in there. And when we're booking hotels, we've learned that you've got to check if they've got a kettle in the room. You can, if you want your porridge in the morning, you, you, you're going to be too early for breakfast in the hotel, making sure that you've got somewhere you can make your breakfast in the morning. What are you eating in the in the mornings before races, for the big, the bigger, longer ones? Um, I will. I'll have some porridge and a banana, and then I have like an energy bar on the way to the race as well. And then a banana whilst I'm still panicking and transitioning before the race. Yeah, and some, some energy gel and juice and stuff. Yeah, just kind of keep myself topped up in the morning. Don't anything too heavy, going into go a swim first thing. So I don't know what you eat. Yeah, it's kind of similar. Yeah, quite similar. I'm kind usually, of bland meal. Yeah, I'm usually like a, piece of, a few pieces of white white toast. Mm. Nutella. Um, I love Nutella. Nutella and bagel. Yeah, so good, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, yeah, a gel and usually. Uh, just a bit of energy, energy juice, yeah. 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 Sure. I have a coffee sure. espresso. Yeah, coffee I do have well. a coffee, yeah. yeah. Coffee is the morning pick me up. Kind of gets everything yeah. moving. Yeah. Free <laughs> 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 race, so that's a good one. Um, so yeah, we I did rough last year. We were about 30 k's from the start because there isn't that many places to stay unless you camp kind of nearby. So it was like up at four in the morning to get to the start. So it's, it's kind of knowing what, what can I eat at four in the morning that is going to stay down and kind of keep me fueled for the start, which is I think about half to six in the morning. And then see you through till you get on the bike and you can actually start taking on solid food again. Um, so yeah, that's a key one. And also if you get there in time for a, like a longer race, make sure that you kind of get to know the course of it. So wrecking the course, um, what have they got on the aid stations? Is it something you're used to? Because race day really isn't the day to be going, oh, try the Red Bull. I don't drink it normally, but I'll have it, it's there. So making sure that you know what they've got on the aid stations. A lot of the Ironman events will have soup and Coke and sometimes sandwiches and things, cake, fruit. It just it sounds really nice at the time and your body will probably tell you what it is that it wants as well because you'll be craving something. So listen to your body, but don't start taking in stuff that you think, well, that's just going to make you ill. I generally try and use in, in some of my key training sessions what it is I'm going to use on race day. So you don't go in kind of blind and go, no, it's, it's an energy gel, it'll be fine. You find that some will not react very well, especially when you've got five or six hours of training in behind you. So it's just kind of trying that, yeah, making sure that when you're at the expo, it's not I'm just going to try that, try that. Oh, I quite fancy new saddle. Just, yeah, hold back. <laughs> I think, yeah, that's another one for the checklist. Thing. Chris turned up for a triathlon without a helmet or, or a wetsuit. <laughs> so, <laughs> luckily it turned into, I think, a duathlon, didn't it? And you borrowed somebody else's helmet. But I would have just been in a panic. Or, well, what am I going to do? It was a lot late, more laid back South American style. So, yeah. Because I know that I I do like to plan and have that in place. So, I can wake up on race morning where I go, I just have to go and race today. I don't have to worry about somebody else borrowing somebody else's track pump or putting the kit on. Yeah. Which part of the track one do you find most challenging in terms of the timing? So we, obviously that you're excelling for a very long time. Do you get to the point where you're like, it's, it's such a it's such a challenge and mentally there's this there's obviously you've, you've um, trained a lot, so you've learned to overcome things, but when you're in the race conditions, is do you ever get to a bit where you're like, Well, it's very, very difficult, so it's good. Yeah, um I think the first probably two hundred meters of the swim because it's just everybody is kind of like going 100 miles an hour just want to get to the front of that pack 
and you just got to like go, okay, I'm going to get my space, I'm going to settle down into it. And then once you get that, you get your rhythm, you settle down, and, and that's cool. And then probably the next point is, is I actually find the bike quite, quite relaxing. It's probably the, not the best, <laughs> not relaxing so much. It's how you're in your zone. You know you, you've got your monitor on the bike, you've got your Garmin, you know where you're meant to be. And it's just kind of focusing on you and not on whatever else is going along behind you. As long as you're not drafting somebody in front of you, you the bike is kind of your own race. I think the run is where it gets mentally tough. I mean, I went into my first Ironman thinking, I can run, it's going to be fine. The, 10, the last 10k of that Ironman was the worst 10k I've ever run. Mm -hmm. Even even the surroundings, like people shouted at me, I was just like completely focused on just that finish line. And mentally, that is the toughest I've found it. So this year I've been right, I've got to, I can't just rely on being able to run. I've got to rely on being able to run after doing the rest of it. And what happens so mentally? What, what are you, in that last 10k, what, how are you? Is it, what is that focus? Is that just... It's, just I've come thinking, this far, yeah. yeah, I've come this far, it's 10k, it, then break that into chunks, right, it's 9k, it's 8k, just knocking those k's off, k by k, making sure that you've got enough energy in your system to do that, just maybe take stock of how you're running as well, because you're probably going to, you can end up kind of getting tired, so just focus a bit more on your form as well, and the people that are on the roadside, take in their energy a bit more, if they're cheering you, shout your name, because your name is on your, on your number, take it on, I mean they're there spending their time volunteering, like clapping you, handing you drinks, and you've made it that far, don't let that last 10k kind of ruin your day, mm -hmm. you're going to get through that finish line. Is there anything you do in training to kind of simulate that fatigue that you get that you get to at that level? I don't think you can simulate that yeah. feeling really without doing the rest yeah, of Yeah, I know, it's, it's, it's something tough. else, so you think yeah. it's like you can get, I find you can get to that level in training. But it's not that level. No, it's not that level. It's and then the not. last 10k, this adrenaline, so the last k, this adrenaline then just kicks in, and you can kind of see the crowd at the finish line. You know, that that's what I've come for. And then you've got to make sure you smile. I have some <laughs> awful photos. <laughs> so you've got to make sure you smile for the finish line, because that's what you're going to get on your email and the kind of on your Facebook stuff. Unless there's somebody taking a really good shot of you somewhere on the course, that that's what you've got to remember the day by. So. Just take it in when you get to the finish and kind of lap it up and then, yeah, put your best face on. So you mentioned earlier about form. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, how aware or conscious are you during the whole Ironman? Okay, obviously you're aware of things around you, but yeah. on, almost on a meditative level, how aware or conscious are you of how your breathing's going, your form, your posture, uh, things slightly out of kill? I mean, are you checking in with yourself the whole time? Yeah, on, on the bike, I'll, I'll, I've got like a timer on my bike where I know where, where I'm going to eat. And so I use that as well to just go, right, am I starting? Even if you have to walk through the aid stations, take that time and just go, right, I'm going to reset myself and go again. Because the aid stations are every couple of miles in a longer race. So you've got that opportunity just to like take check, take stock and go, right, what am I doing? Shoulders down, chest up a bit. And just reset that form a little bit. Yes. Do you train to if when you're running? Do you run to music? Um, during a race, no. No. Because a lot of time you're not allowed. In a, in training, if I'm doing a tempo session, then I'll get I have my kind of my power beats <laughs> that I put on, and I and if I know then the right got to kind of smash those out so I'll do inter I'll do longer intervals now than I'm doing Iron Man so I'll do like ten minute, seven and a half minute intervals with a with a little break in between them. Um so yeah I'll have music for those. If I'm running with other people then no. So you just kind of feed off each other a bit then and take that in on a longer run, um yeah I'll put some music on unless it's really nice scenery. But when you're running around the same route all the time, even if you're changing it slightly you're gonna get a little bit bored. So I just put music on just to keep the tempo that face. Yeah. And so you're, and with your rest days, it sounds like you take those very easy. You're, you're very, if you don't have that rest day, does that really affect your training the next week? Um, you, it'll be a cumulative effect. You'll probably not feel it for a few weeks, but then after that you start to feel like you're just permanently tired. So in my training as well, I'll have a, like a three week block where it's a bit more higher intensity, and then there'll be a definite week where it's a lot lower. I'm not sure how you guys train. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you you can't go 
at 80-90% the whole time. If you can in the short term, but then once you're racing and, and trying to recover from that, you're just going to feel it. My coach says, yeah, you, you can't feel it now, but come October, you're going to be done, and you won't be able to race as hard next year. So it's kind of knowing that your body can only take so much, you have to recover, you have to kind of recuperate as well. So, I mean, I have to put something in the diary to make sure I don't go out for a run. So, yeah, I go in, I go in the Spanish for the evening, and then, yeah, so it's made taking that control and making sure that you do, you do put that rest day in. And how do you fit the social life? <laughs> Um, a lot of our friends, actually I met Chris through triathlon, um, a lot of our friends also do triathlon running. I'm a member of Captain Chasers, which is like a giant dating club sometimes. <laughs> so, so a lot of people have met through the sport. Um, so yeah, but you do, you've got to have some time out and make sure you make that time for yourself as well. That you don't just become in this kind of triathlon bubble, which is, is easy to do. So making sure that when you do go out with friends, you don't do the sport, you have other stuff to talk about. Whereas if all you do is track on the whole time, then you won't. So it's keeping that, keeping that aspect as well. So yeah, I'm not, I'm nowhere teetotal. No people that are um, like my food. So it's it's keeping that balance of being able to do that because I'm not a full time athlete. It isn't my job. It is a hobby. It's got to be fun. You've got to enjoy it no matter how much you're doing it. And. I, I am very competitive, so I like to be at the top end of the of the sport, at, at the age group and on symposium. So I like I do have to focus and spend a lot of time training, but I also think, well, I'm not getting paid to do this. It isn't what's paying my bills. I've got to still be able to function at work. I've got to have friends outside of that. So yeah, keeping that balance is really important. Which has been your favourite race so far? Um, I think there's two last year. I did half Ironman in Lisbon. Which is probably one of my, my, my break my breakthrough race, and then actually getting through Roth. The feeling on the finish line when you finish an Ironman is just it's like so emotional. There's a set then when you get dragged away for a drugs test, but yeah, that was all that added to the whole day. I think actually made me feel quite important. <laughs> but yeah, um, I came second at Ironman at half Ironman in Lisbon, and like I remember I bumped into the girl who came first at um, Roth, and she was like. You were the one who was really excited on the podium. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, that was me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So that one, just everything on the day, just went right. I got I got a pretty good swim time. Got out on the bike. I was on my on my TT bike that I hadn't had very long, and it just all kind of just just went perfectly. I got on the run and I was just overtaking people on the run, and and we had a lot of the of my club mates were there. We'd done the Olympic distance and just having them shouting at you on the course. And yeah, did far better than I expected, and I think a few other people expected on the day, so it just made, made the day. Then, what then was then, your marathon time for that one? Uh, half marathon time, and that one was 1.24. Nice. Yeah, so only a couple of minutes off my PB. So yeah, it just went perfectly. People complained about the heat, about the course, but I was just like, I can't see any of it. I'm just floating along, having a great time. So yeah, that was a great day, and then Roth, just, just to get kind of to the end of that race and have done so well. And um, as a team, I think we won the women's team prize at Roth as well. So the three girls are from our club um, together. So it just kind of made the whole week. But yeah, that, those two go down as one of my best days, I think. What's been your longest injury? Um, probably a few years ago. Um, I trained too hard for a marathon when I was just just solely running and um, got a bit of a, a pretty brutal. Just a tennis ball as well I find, just, you can take anywhere the rolling of your feet. So if you're spending a lot of time on the bike, your foot's actually pretty flat and then go to a swim and you're trying to you know, the dorsiflexion on your foot, it's like something's just cramp. So I spend quite a lot of time on a, on a um, tennis ball and I found out my ankle and um, flexibility's improved massively just by using that as well. So finding what works for you, where portable stuff is good. Do you reckon at some point, once you've absolutely smashed it, you'll you'll consider the tr kind of transition to pro and? I'm uh, getting on a bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you kind of well, you kind of reach your endurance peak. Yeah. Kind of mid thirties, which is where I'm at. So it's it's that, isn't it? And you hear all the stories about people well, they can't afford to be Yeah. Poor. I wish there was a solution for that. Yeah. yeah. yeah it's it'd like, be great just to get paid and not have to win the prize money and just yeah. kind of enjoy the lifestyle. Works in the PGA, you know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, you're probably in the same position that you love to train all the time. Yeah. Yeah, and if you didn't have to work, you probably wouldn't. But yeah, yeah, I think it's finding a job that 
I mean, I, I, I can go home and switch off, thankfully. I'm not, I don't have to be in conference calls at 10 at night, so I can leave the office at 6 and, and focus on what I want to do outside of that. But obviously, if I, if I worked at the Olympics two years ago, um, full time from the January to the October, um, paid staff on, on site basically the whole time, and I realised that I couldn't train during that time. So from the April to the, the October, I, I just thought, right, I'm not going to look at training weeks. I stopped getting coached that time and just went, I'm just going to have to do what I can. And that was quite a tough six months, um, but I had a 22 round, mile round commute. So I used to cycle in every day, cycle home, quite unsociable hours, but then the roads were quiet. And um, we had some swimming pools on site, so if it let me in, I'd go and have a quick swim, but it wasn't that end goal focused training. I didn't have a race in the diary because I was like, I'm just going to be disappointed, I'm going to beat myself up about it. So you have to taste stock sometimes and say, sometimes I know this, this the Olympics is only on until September, Paralympic September, so I've got to focus on work at this time and then I can refocus on the training after that. And that's when I started working at Sports Youth. So, it was knowing that you can't fit everything in in a day, you can only do what you can do, and, and otherwise you're going to burn yourself out really quickly. So that, it was during that time being sleep deprived that Chris taught me to do my own as well, I think. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. So yeah, it's knowing what you can fit into your day and not, and not overdoing it all the time, because you will be it eventually. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Good. Oh, thank you.